محمد يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله يا نبي الله محمد يا رسول الله محمد يا حبيب الله محمد يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله يا نبي الله واللي عجز معك ما اهلا وسهلا انا في الاردن في مدينه عمان I'm in Jordan guys in Amman and I'm going to visit lots of different cities and I'm going to explore the Islamic history in Jordan and I will take you along with me inshallah so the different places we're going to visit is definitely going to include Amman Petra Irbid um Al Karak uh, as salt so basically i'll be traveling from south jordan to north jordan and i've decided to vlog for you guys for the first time and i hope i'll actually vlog this time uh it's so embarrassing and i've never done it before but let's see how it goes today's my first day in jordan in amman and first i went to the sahabi tree and then i went to the ashab al kahf and i'll tell you more about them later on this tree is called the blessed tree or the sahabi tree According to Jordanians, this is the tree where Rasulullah took shade. Now, it can either be when he was a young boy and he traveled with his uncle Abu Talib for a trade journey, and you know, a cloud was following him, and it was under this tree that he took shade and he was noticed by the monk Bahira. Or there's a possibility he took shade under this tree much later on when he was around 25 years old when he worked for Khadija, and on that trade journey, he came and took shade under this tree. Next, I visited the Ashab al Kahf cave, the Seven Sleepers cave. I do want to point out the exact location of this cave is disputed because apparently there is a Ashab al Kahf cave in Turkey as well. But overall, I quite like this place because you do have a nice city view from there as well. And uh, the details of the cave are very interesting. So, this star, which has eight corners, it's because the Jordanians they say there were seven men who were sleeping, and the eighth one was the dog. And this hole that you can see, now they claim that all the bones have been taken out from the different graves and they are all in one place now. So you can kind of see from the hole some of the bones. The arch, this is the Fajwa, which is mentioned in Surat Al-Kahf. So that's where the dog used to sit. Then on this side, they say it was a sunset. And opposite side, this side was the sunrise. And on top of the cave is a masjid. So in Surat Al-Kahf, Allah SWT tells us that the people, they said they were going to build a masjid on top. So they claim this was the original masjid area. Now right next to it, they have actually built a new masjid. And it's quite a nice masjid. Overall, the Sahabi tree was around two hours drive from Amman. And this place was not actually too far from Amman at all. Alaikum. Today I am in King Abdullah Mosque. Uh, it's a blue dome mosque. It looks like it's inspired by Turkish architecture. Uh, this mosque is named after King Abdullah I. This king, he used to travel to Jerusalem every Friday. And one Friday when he went to Jerusalem, he was shot. And in his memory, this mosque was built. This is the biggest and the main mosque of Amman and the Adhan from this mosque is broadcasted live on radio and I actually prayed my last Jumu'ah there. So today was all about the city tour. After visiting the King Abdullah Mosque in the morning, next we headed towards the city deal. These three pillars that you see are the names this city has had. So its ancient name was Rabat Amun and it is said that Nuh salam, one of his sons name was Amun and that's where this name was borrowed from. Uh, so in the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, the city was called Rabat Amun. Then later on when the Romans took over, the city was called Philadelphia. And after that, when the Umayyads took over, they named the city Amman. 
So he built this big temple here and his temple was right at the top of the mountain from where he could see the city from the bottom. So now you can actually see the downtown from there and it looks very nice. And then this is a museum which is also next to Citadel and has lots of like ancient things. Uh, this one is actually a coffin from, I don't know, which century that is, BC something. And that's the view of the downtown. Also, the weather this day was very nice. Otherwise, February is actually quite cold in Amman. Right next to the Citadel, later on the Omeyyads, they built a mosque. And it's a nice, small, pretty mosque. And that's a Jordanian flag, which is so similar to Palestinian flag. So the only difference is they have a little star in the red triangle. Hercules also had a big statue of himself and all that's left now is a piece of his hand. After the citadel, we headed towards the Roman theatre. This theatre was built in the 2nd century when this city was called Philadelphia. It has seating space of 6,000 and these seats are actually stairs and they're actually quite steep as well. So some people from my group, they actually walked up these stairs and they took some nice pictures from right at the top. And not far from the theater is actually the famous Rainbow Street, which is known for shopping. But guess what? We were not allowed to shop because we had to leave for Petra afterwards. But I quickly went to a bakery and got a kunafa for myself. After the city tour, we drove towards Petra. Petra is in South Jordan, which is more nearer to Saudi Arabia, hence it's more of a desert area. As for the North Jordan, it's more nearer to Syria and Palestine and it's more beautiful and green. So before reaching Petra, we actually passed by a place called Wadi Musa. Wadi Musa means the Valley of Moses. And it is said that Musa alayhi salam, he passed by this valley, he struck a rock and water gushed forth. And there's a spring, the spring was called Ain Musa. Later on, when the Nabataeans moved to Petra, they built channels through which water would flow from Wadi Musa into Petra. And there is also a shrine of Harun Ali Salam uh, near Wadi Musa. How authentic this place is, Allahu A'lam. So who were the Nabataeans? It is said that the Nabataeans were from the offspring of Thamud. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us that Thamud were destroyed. The Thamud who were destroyed were all from one area, but some of their family members had moved into different areas. So these Thamud people survived and Nabataeans are from their offspring. And Nabataeans, just like their ancestors, were experts in stone carving. And some of the stone carvings have become very famous and many Hollywood films have actually been shot in Petra. Petra was the capital of the Nabataeans and they were very powerful. Uh, but over time, later on when the Romans took control, then Petra slowly began to decline. Towards the end of Roman times, Petra had declined. Then when the Umayyads took over, Petra was pretty much abandoned and later on the city was actually lost so no one knew where Petra was and then eventually there was a Swiss traveler called Johann Ludwig who was traveling in Jordan he heard stories about the city and he set out to search for it so he pretended to be an Arab shepherd got some sheep and began his journey of searching for Petra and he was the first one to discover it and later on this became a UNESCO site and it's the most visited place by tourists right now. After visiting many tourist attractions, we headed towards many maqams. Maqams of the Sahabas and the Anbiya, starting with the maqam of the great Sahabi. His name was Al-Harith bin Umair al-Azdi. Rasulullah sent letters to many kings inviting them to Islam. One such letter was sent to the king of Busra in Syria. The carrier of this letter was this great Sahabi Al-Harith. He took the letter, the king rejected Islam and one of his governors murdered the Sahabi. It was never allowed to shoot the messenger. When Rasulullah found out that Al-Harith has been murdered, he decided to answer them. And this led to the Ghazwa Mu'tah. This ground that you see, it's where the Battle of Mu'tah took place. It's in the city of Al-Karak in South Jordan. This battle took place in the year 8 of Hijrah. In this battle, Rasulullah appointed three leaders. The first leader was Zayd ibn Haritha. Rasulullah said, if something happens to Zayd, then the next leader will be Ja'far bin Abi Talib. And if something happens to Ja'far, then the third leader will be Abdullah bin Rawaha. 
and he said even if he falls then the muslims should select another leader Zaid bin Haritha was nicknamed the beloved of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wasallam he was the first freed muslim slave to become muslim he was brought up in the household of rasulullah initially rasulullah adopted him but later on my adoption was prohibited rasulullah said he is my brother Rasulullah said my sahaba are like the stars whoever follows them will be guided he's obviously talking about the senior sahaba every sahabi had unique qualities which they utilized to serve the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after zaid was martyred the next muslim leader was ja'far bin abi talib ja'far was the older brother of ali radhiyallahu anhuma and he was the first cousin of rasulullah He looked the most like Rasulullah and he was known for his generosity. He was from those earliest Muslims who had migrated to Abyssinia. And when he returned to Medina, his return was just after the Ghazwa Khaybar. And Rasulullah said at that time, I don't know what makes me more happy, the conquest of Khaybar or the return of Ja'far. And after a couple of months, he was sent for this battle and Rasulullah was never to see his beloved again. After Ja'far's martyrdom, the third Muslim leader was Abdullah bin Rawaha, and he was also martyred. Muslim army in the Battle of Mu'ta were around 3,000 in number. Non-Muslim army were around 200,000. So one Muslim was fighting 67 non-Muslims, but still they were not able to defeat the Muslims. So a tactic they used was, let's kill the leaders. If you kill the leaders, the army will be divided and scattered. And that's why three leaders were all martyred. Overall, the Muslim casualty was less than 20. On the fourth day, we headed towards Irbid in North Jordan. This is where the Battle of Yarmouk took place. This battle was a great victory for the Muslims because it was this battle which brought Islam into these areas of Jordan. First, we went to the maqam of Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu an. Regarding him, Rasulullah said he will be the scholar of all scholars in paradise. During the Khilaf of Abu Bakr Adilan, he had sent armies towards Iraq and towards Sham. But the Battle of Yarmouk took place during the uh, Khilaf of Umar Adilahu An in the 13th year after Hijrah. This battle lasted for six days and it was fought near the river Yarmouk, which is on the borders of Syria and Jordan. Uh, but most of the Sahabas whose shrines uh, we went to, they did not die in the battle. They had passed away because there was a plague, the plague of Amwas. It's just like how we had Corona a few years ago. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf had narrated that Rasulullah said that whoever is in a plague, they should not leave that place. And whoever is outside, they should not enter that place. So it's basically the idea of quarantine. Maqam of Amir bin Abi Waqas, it's in a village which is actually named after him. It's called Waqas. Amir became Muslim at a very young age in Mecca and his mom was really against it and she vowed not to drink or eat. And he had to migrate from Mecca to Abyssinia and then later on he returned and he came to Medina. He participated in the Battle of Uhud and in the Battle of Yarmouk he was martyred. He is the brother of the famous Sahabi Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas. Sa'ad is one of those 10 Sahaba who have been given the glad tidings of paradise. Next, we went to the maqam of the Sahabi Shurhabil ibn Hasana radiallahu an. He was an early Muslim from Mecca and he was also a commander, a warrior. So Abu Bakr radiallahu an, during his Khilafah, he had sent four armies to Sham. And the army which he sent to Jordan, Shurhabil was the commander of this army. And Shurhabil, he was in his late 60s when he passed away in the plague of Amwas. This is the maqam of a famous Sahabi, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. Abu Ubaidah was one of the earliest Muslims and he is also from one of the ten Sahaba who have been given the glad tidings of paradise. In the Battle of Uhud when Rasulullah was attacked and the mattu on his armor had penetrated his cheeks, it was Abu Ubaidah who pulled that metal out with his teeth. 
and he had lost two of his front teeth and he was so happy because he said Rasulullah's blood is mixed now with his blood and Abu Ubaidah was the main leader of the entire army which was sent to Sham during the reign of Umar an. and Abu Ubaidah an, he passed away in the plague of Amwas. It's Ayatul Kursi that's written all around his grave. Olden Sham includes modern four countries. There are Jordan, Syria, Palestine and Lebanon. And interestingly, my guide was saying that before the Arab Spring, it was possible to have breakfast in Jordan, lunch in Syria and dinner in Lebanon. And, you know, casually on Fridays, they would just go to the Damascus Mosque to pray uh, Jumu'ah. But obviously, it's not possible anymore. Okay, next was the maqam of Dirar ibn Azwar. And I love his story because it's all about his sister. We need to know more about our female sahabas as well. So in the battle, when Dirar was captured by the Romans and he was taken as a prisoner, the sister, she was also in the army helping the wounded. And when she found out her brother's been captured, she got a helmet, she got a sword and went in the midst of the army. And she was fighting fearlessly. Everyone thought it's Khalid ibn Walid and Khalid's like, no, it's not me. Find out who this person is. And they found out it's Dirar's sister. So Khalid quickly sent Muslim army behind her and they managed to rescue Dirar and it's all because of his sister. A quick glimpse of the Dead Sea and then we headed towards the tomb of Prophet Shu'aib a.s. Next was the tomb of Ayyub Ali Salam. We reached there at Maghrib time. Finally, it was the last maqam of the day, an Nabi Yusha bin Noon alayhi salam. Fifth and the last day was a relaxing day. It was Friday, prayed Juma in the morning, then explored some local shopping centers, which were Maxim Mall and Abdali Mall. And then there was a wedding in our hotel as well, which I missed out on. And this was my last meal in Jordan. Anyone who loves Zira and Sahaba, they will love Jordan as well.